In Jerusalem, capital of Israel, the narrow streets lead to the top of a hill facing Mount Zion. Here, during the past four and a half weeks, a court has been sitting in a hastily completed building. Surrounded by a high wire fence and guarded by day and by night, a man has been on trial for his life. The man, Adolf Eichmann. His judges, the judges of Israel. His plea, not guilty. <laughs> His accusers, the Jewish people. Jerusalem became an international city 13 years ago when the State of Israel was formed. Here there's still a sense of history and timelessness, a spiritual and cultural center for the Jewish people. It's in Tel Aviv, the largest town, that one gets a feeling of the new Israel. Israel, the home of two million Jews, most of them immigrants from 70 different countries. They've brought with them a widely differing way of life and a wide variety of skills. But is there a danger of the older immigrants outnumbering the young people Israel so badly needs? I put this to Israel's former Prime Minister and Foreign Minister, Moshe Sharet. Well, I wouldn't say that at all. If you take, for instance, the composition of uh, people who have come over from England, uh, most of them are professional people and skilled people, and they come in the prime of life. 20, 30, 40, and not more. I think you would find that the case also with people who come from the United States. Where we do experience a shortage uh, is in the field of industrial development. Uh, the country, in a way, is undergoing an industrial, or rather, technological uh, revolution. And there are, I believe, several hundred vacancies right now uh, for plants already in operation or in the process uh, of erection. That's to say there is a need for highly specialized people, specialized and, and experienced. And I put the same question to three young Israelis. Do you think Israel's got enough skilled people at the moment? Well, I wouldn't say that enough, and especially not in, if we are thinking about all the development plans that we are working on now. Israel is developing very, very quickly, I think, much quicker than almost every other country I know about. And in every year, I think that you can feel more and more the shortage of skilled people. Do you find that all the people who come here, all the different types of Jews who come here, tend to split up into groups, or do they all mix in together easily? Well, uh, I think the natural tendency is to associate people who, with people who speak the same language as you do. I think it, it, it comes mostly from that factor that uh, you feel most at home in your own mother tongue. But as Hebrew becomes uh, the language of the country, uh, that is less and less of a problem. Then you can communicate, then you can speak to other people. And here we uh, all realize the role of the army in breaking down these barriers because it's a tremendous educational institution here. Who has to do service, Bonifat? Both the boys and the girls. Do you think it's a good thing for the girls? I think... Uh, Did you have to do it when you came? No, when I came I was um, already married. And that exempts you, doesn't it? Oh, well, no, you're exempt if you're married and you have a child. And uh, our girl was born a year after we came, so I never got around to serving. Do you think you missed something there by... I think I missed meeting people who came from very different backgrounds. That I really regret. In a country where women are regarded as the equals of men, they're also expected to fight. And at any moment, they may be called upon to do so. Israel is ringed in by unfriendly Arab states. Egypt, Jordan. 
you think it will ever be able to develop as a state while the Arabs are, remain hostile? Is there any chance of them well, changing the, uh, their Arab mind? Arab hostility is, of course, a very serious uh, handicap, but it is also, uh, on the other hand, there is a spur to effort, to, to exertion, to vigilance, to inventiveness. I wouldn't say that uh, it would be worthwhile creating Arab hostility in order to enable our faculties to develop that way, but uh, uh, there is a redeeming feature in the present uh, situation. Uh, I hope very much we shall not be in need of it forever, not even for a long time. Do you think that Israel will ever really be able to develop while there's an Arab problem? I think it will. As a matter of fact, you can see that for the last 13 years we have been developing it very rapidly, although there is our problem. Still, in a certain way, maybe it's something of a blessing in disguise, although I'm not very happy about this kind of disguise. You see, I think it's a challenge for us. And maybe if the situation over here would have been somewhat easier, maybe the challenge wouldn't have been so very strong as it was now. For myself, I think very much, I hope very much for peace in the future, although I'm not very optimistic about the prospects for it in the near future. During the lives of these children, there may never be peace with the Arab world. For the Arabs, the emergence of Israel was a violent shock. In time, it may become a historic memory. But now these children are growing up in a country where hard work starts at an early age. The younger generation is also one of the reasons given by Mr. Ben-Gurion for having the Eichmann trial. He wants to bring home to them the full horrors of crimes against the Jews. For the past two weeks, survivors of Auschwitz, Treblinka, Dachau and other concentration camps have been testifying against the man in the dock. Outside the court, feelings are also running high. Eichmann's right, uh, right, he must be hanged. Eichmann, mm. he's a criminal. Do you think it's a good idea to remind people of all these things again? No? Of course. Why do you feel that? Uh, there will be no repeating crimes like this. It's been suggested that the trial is to remind people of what Eichmann did. Do you think people here need reminding? I'm not sure that they want to be reminded of it, but I'm sure that they ought to be reminded of it, because it's a very important, I would say, chapter in our history, in which a, a very great part of our nation has been murdered. I am against the trial. Why? Well, I don't think a man can be tried on a moral issue. I'm looking at it from the legal point of view more than the emotional point of view. So I don't feel one man can pay for the crime of killing six million Jews. The Jews now have a country of their own. But will it really become the national home that they've sought for so long? What I believe uh, would be the right uh, way of defining the situation is to say that by becoming a state, this country has not ceased to be a national home uh, for the Jewish people. It has become a state for its uh, citizens, naturally. But it serves uh, even more than it did before, a kind of a spiritual center, a focus of pride uh, and a source of inspiration for most Jews uh, the world over. May I ask you, Mr. Sherratt, why you think it is that the Jews have always been a persecuted people? Because they've survived. <laughs> uh, if, uh, uh, if the fate of the Jews uh, were the same as of many other ancient uh, peoples or races uh, who were uprooted uh, from their soil by the conquering power, that's to say if they had dissolved in their environment, there would have been no problem. Uh, but uh, the Jews, for some reason, refused to dissolve. Uh, maybe because they had some sort of a spiritual superiority complex, uh, having, having invented, having been the first to invent the idea of one God. Uh, and so they maintained uh, their inner cohesion, also they, their spiritual tie with their, uh, with their home, and, and a very fierce attachment to their religion.